Good morning, East Side. Um, I'm going to give everybody a little bit of time to um, find this. Um, preaching from my dad's office this morning, so hopefully we don't have any interruptions. Uh, but um, this morning we're going to be talking about uh, the church. We're going to be talking about the body of believers. And um, we'll be in 1 Corinthians a lot, uh, if you have that ready, if you want to uh, read along anywhere. Um, so, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, centuries ago in Europe, there was a wealthy nobleman who decided he was going to start a church building um, for the mountain village that he'd grown up in. He had a lot of money, so he decided he was going to uh, build this building, and everybody in the village was very excited to see what he created, and but nobody was allowed to see the plans uh, until it was totally finished. Well, finally the day arrived, and the people gathered on Sunday to, to marvel at the, the beautiful new building, but when they went inside, someone said, hey, where are the lamps? It's dark in here. Where are the lamps? Then the nobleman pointed uh, to a line of brackets along the wall, and he said, every time you come to church on Sunday, you need to bring your own lights. And he explained, um, each time you come here and you're seated, you will have your own light. But every time you're not here, your place will be dark. And this is to remind you that whenever you fail to gather with the church, a part of the church will be darkened. Now, that illustration is, is modified a little bit. The original story places emphasis on the idea that the church building was the church. Well, that's not the case. We as Christians are the church, and a building is just a building in the end. And I think we're realizing that more and more in our current circumstances, that the building uh, doesn't have to hinder us. We can still meet together uh, via media, uh, and nothing's going to stop us. Um, so the building is not the church. You are the church. So the point is that when we don't get together as a church family, if we don't get together somehow, it can take a toll on us. And that's hard to deal with in these current circumstances. But the point is we need each other. In fact, the Bible is very clear on the idea that God's people need each other. Back in the Old Testament, God declared, two are better than one. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. That comes out of Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. A cord of three is not easily broken. Uh, I, if you take one piece of string and you, and you yank it, it's probably going to break. But if you think of something like paracord, where there's like a hundred of these tiny little strings attached together, you try and yank that, I mean, that thing will hold you uh, when you're parachuting in the sky, whenever you're ziplining down a I don't know if you've ever zip line, but it, it'll, it'll hold you. It'll keep you safe. Um, that's what it's like when the church comes together. We're stronger. But Paul tells the church at Corinth, um, oh, sorry, sometimes we can forget that, that we need each other. Sometimes congregations forget that. Sometimes churches believe that they're total purpose in life is to just show up at the church and and just um, receive stuff. Uh, they believe that the preacher or the elders or the, the worship band are the ones that are supposed to be doing everything. And they have a job to do. Do not get me wrong. There's They have a job and they, they are a part of the body. And um, so people show up on Sunday. They smile. They sing. Uh, they pray, they listen to the sermon, and then they just go home or they go to their favorite Mexican restaurant. Um, but they don't need each other. 
Uh, they just need the people up front uh, during church. But Paul tells the church at Corinth, he says, no, that's not the way this works. You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. And Paul writes, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. 1 Corinthians 12, 21. We need each other, and more than ever. As Ecclesiastes reminds us, we're in this together, all of us, as the body of Christ. And when we're together, we have others around us to help us, um, to keep us warm, to protect us, to keep us from being broken down by the hardships of life, all of these things. Now, God deliberately uses the imagery of being the body of Christ. And in Ephesians 5.29, we're told, No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the body. God reminds us that we, being the body, being the church, need each other, and we need to nourish and cherish the body of believers that we're a part of, just like we nourish and cherish our physical body. So think about that for a minute. <clears throat> think to yourself, how do you nourish and cherish your own body? How do you steward your body well? Well, you, you feed it. Uh, sometimes you feed it really well. We're about to be eating real well uh, come Thanksgiving time. Um, I know I'm excited. I had a Friendsgiving yesterday, and I, am, I think I about gorged myself. I'm, I'm so full. Um, so you also you clean it. You take showers, a bath, shaving, hopefully. If you're sick, you see a doctor. If your teeth hurt, you go to the dentist. All of these things, <clears throat> you clothe yourself. And once in a while, you even, you know, pamper yourself. You, you go have a spa day maybe with the ladies. I don't know. Um, but now God is telling you, you, every one of you, that you are part of a spiritual body. And he's asking you personally to take care of that body. And so how do we do that practically? How do we nourish and cherish Christ's body? Well, first we need to realize that being <clears throat> a part of the body of Christ means that God expects us to participate uh, with that body. Before the COVID crisis, that was more tangible. That was um, supposed to be easier. Um, and I think in ways we're learning how we took it for granted. So in a way, I'm thankful that we um, hopefully it hopefully makes us realize that. But he's asking you personally um, uh, to take care of the body. So um, east side, we do a great job of this uh, when we're together. Um, we love on each other. Um, before COVID, we were we were able to um, to meet together and care for each other and and uh, talk about life with one another. We're I want to encourage uh, all of us that are part of that church that we do a great job at that. Um, and um, even after COVID, we've been able to meet together some. And I've been, I myself personally have been encouraged every time I've been able to meet with all of you. Um, but unfortunately, uh, too often in too many congregations, um, that is not um, what usually happens. That usually doesn't happen. Francis Chan observed that it's no secret that people who attend church services come more as consumers, and they don't want to get involved. Um, years ago, this is a, a very old illustration, but if uh, some of you uh, older folk remember Snoopy, uh, he was in a comic strip, and he, the, the authors of this uh, comic strip, they... Uh, had Snoopy, he broke his leg. And believe it or not, there were hundreds of get well cards that came for poor Snoopy. And they came in from across the world. Uh, and Snoopy in this 
comic strip with his leg in a cast, he says this, my body blames my foot for not being able to go places, and my foot says it was my head's fault, and my head blames my eyes, and my eyes say my feet are clumsy, and my right foot says not to blame him for what my left foot did. And then Snoopy in the comic strip looks out at the audience and he confesses, I don't say anything because I don't want to get involved. Now, why is that funny? Why is that comical? It's because Snoopy was involved, um, believe it or not. It was his foot, it was his head, his eyes and his feet. He was involved because that's all of him. That's all a part of his body. And we're a part of the body of Christ. And the body of Christ needs you to be involved. I think too often um, the leaning today would be to disassociate. To if something's going wrong, if something's going bad, we want to have one foot out the door just in case. I'm going to encourage you today to be to not be that way, to be fully in, fully committed. Take ownership of the church because you're part of it. So what can we do to involve ourselves with the body? Some of the stuff that we already do, um, and I want to remind you and encourage you to do ever more. We want to pray for each other. We need to be praying for each other. The power of prayer is real. And I know at Eastside, uh, we do do a good job of this. And um, I, I've seen uh, the power of prayer um, work in my life. And I've, I've heard of the many great things that prayer has done for other people's life. Um, we try and make people feel like they're important. We want to encourage each other. We want to be um, like the Barnabas of the Bible. We want to go and empower people. Um, to be the best advocates for Christ that we can, to encourage them in their walk with Christ. It's very important. Um, and we need to take care of each other's needs, whether that be financial needs, food, clothing, all of these things. Uh, and there are people at East Side who, who do these things. They check in on shut-ins and the sick. And um, I know of some of you that send out encouraging cards Let's keep it up. Um, and that's especially important in this post-COVID world. We don't have the opportunity to interact as much as we did before. And we don't, we don't know what's going to happen day to day with the ordinances and, and the government mandates. So don't take anything for granted. Uh, that's why now... We actually need to emphasize our cell phones. We need to use these things for good. We need to stop meaninglessly scrolling through our phones, however, and instead intentionally call people, email people, contact each other on Facebook, send cards and letters. Contact people and let them know that you're at least thinking of them and pray for one another because we need each other church. And even more than that, I need you. Um, I make mistakes. I fail. Um, and I will also suffer from tone deafness. Um, and I'm going to ask you to keep me accountable. If you think that um, there's something that I need to be doing or that I need to, I need to pray for someone or I need to talk to someone, you let me know. Keep me accountable. Make sure that I am um, being the best part of the body that I can be. So we're all in this together. In addition, a lot of churches miss an extremely important part of the, the nourishing, encouraging that we need to do for each other. And the reason a lot of churches do this is because they're oriented around the preacher well, the preacher is not everything. The preacher, um, with a lot of these churches, the preacher is the center of the church, and everything rises and falls with the preacher. In a lot of churches, the preacher 
does the work of the ministry and everybody else is just the cheering section. But that's not, not how God set things up, believe it or not. That's not the way uh, this is supposed to go. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 3-4, we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which ourselves are comforted by God. What those verses are saying is each of us is comforted by God in our struggles and afflictions so that we can comfort others in their affliction. God trains us to minister to one another. I remember whenever I was younger in youth group, it was always awkward whenever we started talking about um, the deeper subjects, our struggles and our afflictions, especially with a bunch of middle school to high school boys. So much pride and so much um, um, all of this. Um, we want to be closed off and seem stoic at that age. And we're scared to share our struggles and our afflictions because of what others may think of us. And I remember whenever this would happen, it only took one, one guy to open up and share his struggle, share the things that he was dealing with, and it snowballed from there. It is amazing what realizing that other people are going through the same things that you are, uh, what it will do for others. They can open up. They can be comforted that they have people that are fighting alongside them in this same struggle. We're all in this together, and we need each other. Um, now, one last thought. Whose body is the church? Whose is the church? Who does the body belong to? It belongs to Jesus, um, plain and simple. It's the body of Christ. Colossians 1, 16 through 18 says... For by Christ all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him, and they were created for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from, from the dead, that in him everything might be preeminent. Christ is the head of the church, and he is the head of the body. So why is that important? Because somebody has to be in charge, and if it's not Jesus, who's it going to be? Is it the preacher? Is it the elders? Who is it? No, it's Jesus. Sometimes young kids, I've heard of young kids asking pastors, you know, do you own the church? And the preacher will respond, no, I don't own the church. Well, then who owns the church? And the pastor will respond, well, Jesus does. And kids don't always understand that. Uh, they don't always grasp that. Well, hopefully, you know, uh, through learning and growing up, they'll, they'll get that one day. But it is true. That's why I'm glad that part of our church name says Church of Christ. That's very fitting because Christ owns the church. But, you know, it doesn't matter what's on the sign out front because unless the church, not just the church building, but the body, unless the body of believers belong to Jesus Christ, we've failed. You see, the church sign, or in this case, being online, the church website, I guess, um isn't bragging about who we are. It's bragging about whose we are, who we belong to. It's a proclamation that, that Jesus owns us. He's our head. He's our master. He's our savior. And he holds us, the body of Christ, together. He is the glue. And we call ourselves a church of Christ because we love him and we belong to him and because we want to spend eternity with him one day in heaven. So the question for you this morning is, do you, 
Do you love him? Do you belong to him? And do you want to spend eternity with him? And the great thing about this is you can do all that this morning. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the son of the living God, uh, that you acknowledge that you have sinned and you need to repent. And if you're willing to confess that, that Jesus will now be Lord and master of your life. And hopefully um, with these situations, you can be baptized and, and buried in the waters of baptism and rising to new life with Christ. Well, I love every one of you, and I hope that you have a great Lord's Day. Uh, I'm out. See ya.